There's a light in the sky Rising in the air There's a feeling so strong It's time to light the fire Like a branch on the light Yes, hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and it's great to be sitting alongside Joe Stanley, Luke Hines and a very special welcome to our old mate Gus Warren who's pulling in for Rachel Finch. Hello, big welcome, Gus. Welcome, mate. Yeah, yeah. I look just like Rach, don't I? Well, <laughs> sorry, everyone. It's a contrast, but always great to see you. And Thank as you. always, Gus, what I love about you, mate, you're always helping other people who are in need. And let's be honest, our farmers are in a devastating drought at the moment. They're doing it really tough. Yeah, they are. We went out there a couple of weeks ago and I'm going to talk about it a little bit uh, more in the show, but yeah, just the disconnect between the city and the country at the moment has never been more, and I think we just need to get out there and help them as much as we can. That is what Australia's hearts truly is. Yes, Gus, we'll be hearing more about your drought support tour a little later, and Joe, you'll be looking at a common problem that's really spoken about. Yeah, I mean, it is a little bit awkward, but if we're honest, a lot of us can admit that we have peed a little bit when we oh. laugh. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of us, I'm not saying this, okay. yeah, I don't know, but incontinence affects more people than we realise. Five million Aussies, in fact, I'm embarrassed. And, I love this show. Gus is in quiet for the ride today. Yeah. You know what? And it's not just the elderly, so we're going to be talking about that. And Heinze, we're also getting the facts about male fertility from you. That is exactly right, Legend. Often when it comes to fertility discussions, it's arranged around the female, but we'll be helping make sure that your swimmers are in Olympic condition with some info, guys, on sperm health. Oh, it's going to be a great show today. <laughs> and to kick things off, we meet an absolute champion of Australian sport, basketball star, AFLW co-captain Aaron Phillips, is a two-time premiership player already with Adelaide Crows. She was named best on ground, Joe, as you know, twice in the two grand finals, 2017 and 2019. She is one of the most impressive athletes I've ever met. Football's in my DNA. As soon as I could basically walk and talk, I wanted to be a football player. I started at a junior club called Smosh West Lakes and, and played for them right up until the age of 13. And like many stories of girls playing footy with the boys, I you know, was no longer able to keep playing in that league. So it was um, pretty much the end of my football journey and started playing, playing basketball. Basketball may have been plan B for Erin Phillips, but she was never going to be second best. A true South Australian, Erin had her eyes on the Opals, Australia's national basketball team. It was just phenomenal. Like My first real year of campaign with the Opals was two gold medals, um, and obviously at the World Championships, you know, that was 13 years ago, but it was just, it was unbelievable. Unbelievable team that we had in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and those kind of memories that last forever, those friendships that last forever, and winning a gold medal is so special because it's in history forever, and it's Australia's only gold medal for basketball. Erin's basketball career took her all over the world, including to two Olympics, but one phone call would bring her back home. I was getting ready for an Olympic campaign and um, the LA Crows called me while I was overseas in America and having not played for 17 years, I guess I stopped playing football but I never stopped being a footballer which was kind of how I looked at things and it was kind of like, oh my God, am I going to play, am I really going to play AFL football again? After 17 years, there was a lot of buzz around the newly formed AFLW League but no one could have predicted how big it would become. I remember being at home watching first game at Icon Park and when I heard it was a lockout, I was just, it was, it, it gave you goosebumps. It was, I got butterflies in my stomach and I thought, gosh, I mean, this is a huge sign of what's to come for AFLW. The Adelaide Crows named Erin co-captain and together they made it to the inaugural AFLW Grand Final. Crows win! You know, to be a part of the first premiership team in the inaugural Grand Final was, was awesome and something that you'll never ever forget. you look back on in 30 years, 40 years time and be like, oh, it was the first ever premiership. It was something really special. The Crows made a second Grand Final appearance in 2019 
but winning the flag came at an enormous cost. Erin Phillips on the turn has gone down. Yeah, the third quarter and just a, a change of direction that I've been practicing a million times of what not to do and I, I just, I did, I stepped too far out and my knee just completely gave way. As soon as it, I went down, I knew exactly what I'd done. I've actually thought I might have broken my leg as well because it made, it made a really horrible sound as well. But that's just sport, that's just unfortunately the way um, things go sometimes. It takes a year to heal an ACL injury. Many hours of precise strength training and recovery. Even through the, the bad days, I call them, I guess, days of opportunities to you know, get better. You learn a lot about yourself through the difficult moments of, of rehab and I've been really lucky because I've, had, I've got three kids and that keep me pretty well distracted and put things into perspective and even if I play again or, or not, I'm, I've attacked this rehab like I'm going to because being an athlete there's no other way I know how to do it. <laughs> um, hopefully I do get to play again. I'm feeling really good at the moment and hopefully, you know, the next few months keep going the way they go, I'll be able to run back on a footy field. She is remarkable, Erin Phillips. She spoke in that story about the age of 13 having to give up football because mm. there wasn't a chance to play. At that stage, she was boy or girl, the best 13-year-old player in the state. Yep. I remember the word coming through. You need to see Greg Phillips' daughter, Erin, play football. How amazing. She went and won gold medals for Australian yeah. basketball and now back. Incredible. And incredible to pick up a footy after 17 years and to be <laughs> so good. <laughs> amazing. It is amazing. And what about her beautiful children, two-year-old twins, and her wife and her Tracy have just had a baby boy as well. I just adore her. She now divides her time, Erin, between here and Dallas where she helps develop US basketball players. Let's hope we see her back as captain of the Crows again in 2020. Up next, we can see the forest for the trees as Vanessa helps open our eyes to the healing power of nature. That's right here on the House of Wellness. Welcome back to the House of Wellness. Joe, last week we ran a story on the healing and feel-good power of indoor plants and we touched on something called forest bathing as well. Yeah, I love this. It's the Japanese concept of simply immersing yourself in a lush green landscape in order to de-stress and improve your mood. And while indoor plants are undergoing a bit of a revival, especially for us city folks, if you can keep them alive, <laughs> uh, there's a shift towards using nature and in particular forests as therapy. It's called forest bathing and who better to put the tech detox to the test than our own Vanessa Tohoka. Have you ever stopped, closed your eyes and listened to what your life sounds like? What if you could make it all stop? The Japanese have the secret to shedding the stress through nature. Forest therapy originated in Japan, where it's called Shinrin Yoku, and it translates into forest bathing. And what it means in terms of forest bathing, it means immersing in the atmosphere of the forest. And it's widely known today as a way to get people to connect to nature for physiological and mental well-being. Being in nature is great for the soul, but Susan has the key to reaping the full benefits. Is walking as if you are kissing the earth with your feet. Forest therapy, first and foremost, involves slowing down. We tell people to unplug from technology and plug into nature. Being a tech head and constantly connected, I might find this a little tough. Forest therapy, we focus on our senses, and here we really get in touch with our sense of smell. A smell is a really powerful sense for us human beings, and when we connect to smell, quite often it, it brings around certain memories. Yeah. It's also a very calming way to bring down our levels of stress. In our modern day society, lots of stress is part and parcel of life. So when we walk in nature, in a forest therapy way, we bring down 
cortisol, we bring down our levels of stress, we bring down our levels of, of uh, heart and blood pressure. It helps people to benefit both in a physical well-being sense and also mental well-being. It is quite marvelous how, yes. how the rain changes everything. It's not as simple as just slowing down. Nature's medicine is all around us. We are breathing in what is called phytoncides, volatile chemicals that are given out by the trees and through its leaves. And when we breathe in these phytoncides, it goes into our bloodstream and it stimulates what is called the natural killer cells, our immune system. And the larger the tree, the more phytoncides it emits, like this one. What I would ask you to do is first, yes, you say hello to the tree, but also look at the textures of the tree. What is it about these textures of the tree that you're noticing? It's just so strong and kind of rough. Yes. And incredibly huge. <laughs> it is. And just what we are used to in our day-to-day -day life is touching our screens. It's just smooth. Everything is smoothened out for us. We don't see the rough edges of life. We don't, we probably avoid the rough edges of life. And coming in connection with a tree like this teaches us that even in these rough, we, we need to experience the rough patches of our life. This is very different to my phone screen, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, how often do we hug a tree? Can we even hug <laughs> Should a tree? we hug? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the best feelings in the world to hug a tree. It's I can tell you that. It's pretty lovely. And just look up. I always say people look up, they often forget to look up and this is, you know, you notice so many beautiful things about trees when you look up. It's very beautiful and I think it's unlike anything I've felt since I was a little kid. Deep within us, our DNA is our connection to nature, that's where we evolved as a human race. What forest therapy does is we, it, it, it sort of reconnects us back to that place and even if you don't find the time to come and do a forest therapy guided walk, just go out to nature by yourself. Feel that connection. Give yourself permission to just sit with nature and that's all you need to do. Oh, Vanessa, you look so <laughs> at peace there. How was it? It was beautiful and very surprising. I am not really a tree-hugging hippie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> But Susan was so lovely introducing me to the experience and to really feeling grateful for the environment around me. The air was beautiful. Mm. I don't think I really usually took time to appreciate the sensations and the smells and just it was very calming. And just the breath of it I guess. So they say it's a practice kind of like meditation. It's not a one-off thing. You've got to go back and keep doing it. Do you think you will? I think I'm going to take my mother. I was such a fan she needs of the experience. It, she... <laughs> <laughs> I'm say so. No, no. But she would definitely enjoy the slow down and meditative aspect of that. Mm. Yeah. Vanessa, it seemed like you learnt so, so much. How important is it to have a qualified guide with you? <laughs> I think it helped so much because there's uh, details about how to slow down and pay attention to the environment and there's things I don't think I would have noticed. But after after you've been on a guide, I think you could take yourself, I think you could take your friends and really just try and take it slowly. Vanessa, thank you so much for bringing that story to us today. Any excuse to get out amongst nature seems like a good idea. Still to come, we take the stigma out of a condition that affects millions of Aussies, plus the ins and outs of fertility and pregnancy health. That's next on The House of Wellness. Yeah. Welcome back to the House of Wellness. I think it's well established on this show that we love our food, particularly organic food and products. And Heinz, the organic vegan food is even the theme of your latest cookbook. And mate, congratulations. Number one cookbook in Australia right now. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah. So great. I really appreciate it. And it's funny you say that because organic and vegan are very much buzzwords at the moment, but for very good reason. And I'll break each one down quickly. Firstly, when it comes to organic, it's not just fancy or paying more for produce. It means that the produce has been done the right way. So when it comes to fresh fruits and veggies, herbs and whatnot, it means they haven't been sprayed with chemicals or pesticides. And then when it comes to animals and animal protein when it's organic, it means it's grass-fed grass-finished, free-range, pasture-raised, 
all the things that when we vote with our dollar, the right thing and the right farming practices are happening. Now, if we strip that back to organic vegan food, well, vegan simply means something without an animal involved or used in the product. So it's just real food. So my, I always encourage people just to eat fresh fruits and vegetables in their most natural state. And if you learn how to cook and get in the kitchen, incredible things happen with your health. So you reduce any of those inflammatory markers that you might get in your health or lifestyle and you begin to thrive. I mean, our mate Michael Mosley is oh, yes. always going on about it. Yeah, he really is. He's a huge fan, Heinze. He claims his diet cured his diabetes, which is a pretty amazing thing. But let's take it one step further. It's not just organic food that's good for us. A New Zealand company is combining the best ingredients found in nature with science to create a pioneering range of organic, vegetarian, and vegan beauty products. Take a look. The land of the long white cloud is a wealth of rolling green mountains and lush native bush, a land steeped in legend. So when it came to creating a skincare range that harnessed that natural beauty, for science graduate Elizabeth Barbalik, it was a no-brainer. New Zealand has a lot of amazing bioactive ingredients, so I felt that I could really uh, take the best of New Zealand nature and turn that into a beauty brand that had high performance, so a skincare brand that was science plus nature. And that's exactly what she did. Antipodes is the marriage of raw super fruit extract and a love of science, blended with a desire for a more holistic lifestyle. Well, at the time I had three children under four, so it was a very tiring period of my life and I was really looking at how to live a lot cleaner and to boost my energy levels. And we looked at everything as a family from healthy food products, raw ingredients, uh, cleaning products in the household and eventually this led into looking at skincare products with natural ingredients. New Zealand is bursting with plant species that have evolved in geographic isolation over thousands of years. Elizabeth set about sourcing specific extracts, convinced that they deliver a powerhouse of antioxidants and nutrients to the skin. What we do that is really unique and different to any other brand in the natural space is that we test our end formulations on human fibroblast skin cells and look at how our products support collagen production or elastin production or inhibit oxidative stress. And that's what sets Antipodes apart. All the anti-aging products are scientifically proven. A rare achievement outside most conventional skincare brands. OK, so these are the three brand pillars, nature, science, fashion, innovation at the core, all wrapped up in New Zealand nature. It's yeah. an approach that forms the culture of Antipodes, natural and organic and scientifically validated. These products are produced using sustainable organic farming methods. We use a fully biodegradable card on all of our packaging from sustainable forests and we use vegetable inks. Elizabeth knows though that the key to fantastic looking skin isn't always surface deep. I look after my own skin by having a plant-based vegan diet. I start the day with a raw juice and that really gives my skin a great boost. I try and get at least nine hours sleep every night and I like to exercise daily. Oh, you know, I have to say, I'm loving the organic and, surprising to me, the vegan movement, I have to say, Heinze. I love your cookbook. I'm using it a lot. Thank you. And I have a question for you from my 10-year-old daughter, Willow. Hit me up. Do vegans eat honey? They don't. It's an interesting one. So a lot of raw treats and healthy vegan treats use maple syrup or coconut nectar, but not honey, because the bees Little make that bees. honey and they don't want to do anything to destroy their habitat or put pressure on bee populations. Wow. Good question and good answer from you, <laughs> Heinze, from finding beauty and nature, the healing properties and power that we know all about. With Jared Quigley, who's got more information on this than anyone. Welcome to you, GQ. Thank you, Darcy. And nature is all about the circle of life, isn't it? But there are... We, let's shift the focus a little onto men's fertility and sperm health. And sadly, even though the four of us big, virile blokes, there's a, <laughs> there's a number of things that can affect both our fertility 
and sperm health. Like what, GQ? All those things we talk about, our level of stress, whether we drink, whether we um, smoke, um, our food choices, and often there's some medical conditions as well which can affect your fertility and your sperm health. So I caught up with a colleague of mine, Professor Mark Cohen, and threw lots of questions at him. Let's hear what he's got to say. So in the fertility stakes, Mark, where does Australia rate? Well, the birth rate in Australia is going down, but in fertility, we also know that there's more of an issue. Um, you know, as time goes on, people are having more trouble conceiving. And they say that one in six people, one in six couples in Australia have issues with fertility. About one in three cases of infertility are due to the male and factors with their sperm. Are there particular things, in your view, that contribute to poor sperm health? Physical trauma to the testicles, so people riding mountain bikes, trail bikes, rodeo riders classically um, have you know, poor sperm health. Mm -hmm. um, heat is a factor, so hot bars or saunas can actually reduce sperm health and, and sperm motility. Mm -hmm. And then there's metabolic stress, which is due to bad diets and, and just being unhealthy. That has a big impact on, on sperm health and sperm production. IVF is an option, an expensive option for couples trying to conceive. Are there any natural options that people can look at? Of course. Um, you know, IVF is a, it's almost like surgery. It's a, sort of a last resort. Um, and really, you, know, you need to start with just being really healthy. Mm -hmm. and, and being healthy is simple. You, know, you need you know, clean water, good food, fresh air, you know, physical activity, you know, a healthy environment and people to love. I mean, that's, that's the simple equation for being well. And what about a supplement, Mark? Well, there is. Um, I mean, the main one is ubiquinol, which is a, the reduced form or the active form of CoQ10. And that's an energy molecule. So ubiquinol is ubiquitous in the body. That's why it's got its name. It's actually everywhere in every cell that needs energy. But it's also a very powerful lipid-soluble antioxidant. So it helps the membranes in your body um, guard against outside attack from free radical damage. In male fertility in particular, Mark, what role does ubiquinol play in supporting sperm health? Well, ubiquinol supports sperm health by protecting the sperm from damage, so it helps preserve the, sh the right shape, the morphology of the sperm. It also helps with sperm motility by giving energy to the sperm to keep you know, swimming and travelling where they need to go. And it can also help with sperm production by enhancing general health and, and giving a, you know, a higher sperm count. There are many reasons for male infertility. So if, if men are worried about their sperm health, it's really important they see a practitioner and get their, their sperm assessed and you know, their general health reviewed. But certainly the, the male has a very important role. Producing children is, is our purpose in life and it's the purpose of our body. So it requires you know, our bodies to be in the healthiest um, state they can be to actually have healthy offspring. It's been great information, Mark. Thanks for the chat. And let's start all the positivity with a cup of tea. Yeah, nice herbal tea. Herbal tea. Thank you, Gerald. Welcome back. So we're staying with topics below the belt today, Joe. And I think it's fair to say that most of us have had a momentary accident from time to time where we maybe laugh suddenly or exercise or sneeze. Well, look, I, I will say the first time I was on a trampoline after I had my daughter <laughs> gave me a fright. Okay. I was a little, like, this is not a good time for me. Let's I can, hop I, off. I can tell you my wife talks about it all the time. Even my youngest daughter at times does it. I certainly feel it when I'm facing a fast bowler just a little bit <laughs> in the box. Just a little bit, but I'm just that little bit of frightened. Oh, I think we all know that feeling, but for some people... It's not an occasional thing. Incontinence is a loss of control over your bladder or your bowel. And a staggering one in four Australians over the age of 15 live with it, Joe. That is over five million Aussies. And perhaps surprisingly, incontinence affects people of all ages and not just older people. And while the subject might make us giggle or blush, for <laughs> sufferers like 21-year-old model Anya Christofferson, incontinence is no laughing matter. Appearances can be deceiving. From the outside, model Anya Christofferson is beautiful. But what's happening on the inside is a very different story. So it's like a really invisible disability. Everything inside is very messed up, but on the outside it looks fine. 
Multiple issues with her internal organs have meant most of her young lifetime has been spent in and out of hospital. So when I was born, obviously, I had my first lot of surgeries at five hours old, um, and then at seven months, I had to have a full pelvic reconstruction. I didn't have the natural muscle contractions in my bowels to push things through. I didn't have natural muscle contractions to swallow properly. So even now I have to drink when I eat because I can't swallow. So just things like that. I was in and out of hospital, I think, a hundred times before the age of five. The most shattering side effect has been coping with a problem not many young people like Anya would face. So I've been incontinent my entire life. Um, I have absolutely no bowel control. And it's not that I don't just have bowel control, but it's actually that I can't even feel when I need to go to the bathroom. But rather than retreat with her condition, Anya decided to try out modelling, bravely bearing her scars and risking her incontinent issues. Yeah, I actually modelled in a really small white bikini. And as someone with incontinence and scars, that can be a little bit scary. But it was wonderful and I felt the best I've ever felt on that stage, honestly. Her renewed confidence propelled her to write about her experience. She's now an author, a motivational speaker and the Youth Ambassador of the Continents Foundation of Australia. Her crowning achievement was being this year's runner-up in the Miss Grand Australia, a pageant designed around empowering women. I actually still get goosebumps, but it was just the most incredible experience. Breathing in at the top, hold it, come down. Anya has learned to cope with her bladder and bowel problems and has become the voice for the many with incontinence who suffer in silence. Let's do two more. So the first main message, obviously, is that you are not alone. Lots of people out there feel really stigmatised or ashamed of this condition. I think it's so important to know that, you know, you're one in four Australians that has this condition and you aren't alone. You can find others, you can reach out, you shouldn't have to be ashamed about it. The second thing is not to be defined by your circumstances. So if you're incontinent, don't define yourself by that incontinence. You are so much more than that. And don't let it be something that holds you back because at the end of the day, you can let anything hold you back. And especially if you aren't able to find the right treatment or prevention methods for incontinence, and there are plenty out there, then just you have to pursue your dreams. You can't let it stop you. What an incredible young woman that lady is. Joining us now, a specialist in pelvic health. Welcome physiotherapist, Sean Morrison. Hello, Sean. Hi, Dars. How are you? Great. Thank you for joining us. What exactly is incontinence? So, as you said earlier, it's the loss of control of bladder and bowel. So, it's accidentally losing a bit of urine from the bladder or some bowel motion from, from the bowel. And so, what causes it? So there's actually a range of different causes. Um, weak pelvic floor muscles, which we're going to chat a little bit about later. Mm -hmm. um, and just when the bladder or bowel are, is misbehaving. OK, and we, I think, all have assumed it is mostly elderly people that uh, suffer from this. But as we saw with Anya, it can be anybody. Young people, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. We do tend to think it's only older people, but actually half the people who suffer incontinence are under 50. And we actually know that one in 50 teenagers experience it. So well. why are we seeing it in these younger people? Yeah, it's a good question, Luke. So sometimes it's nighttime problems, so where they're continuation of bedwetting from being a child. But younger people can experience what we call stress incontinence, which is when they laugh or cough or lift or sneeze or jump or run, they can lose a bit of urine. And also there's a condition called overactive bladder, where the bladder doesn't behave itself and it makes you rush to the toilet quickly and then sometimes not make it there on time mm. when you're telling it you're ready to go. Now, the stigma around it is quite incredible. What happens if people are finding it and they don't want to talk about it, so they're worrying alone and doing it alone? It's so true, Gus. I mean, it is very... It's embarrassing. People feel very, um, you know, demoralised by it. And we see people isolate themselves. So they isolate themselves socially, don't want to engage with their friends. They isolate themselves from exercise. And we know that exercise is the most important thing we should be doing every day. So we find a lot of people experiencing incontinence actually don't exercise. And they certainly withdraw from intimacy and it impacts their relationships and their self-esteem. Is it true that if you hold on, like make a habit of holding on for too long, you can cause yourself damage? Yeah, it's a good question. So there's a happy medium there. So you shouldn't go too often. You shouldn't go just in case, but then you shouldn't hold on too much. And then with your bowel, you should always respond to a bowel urge. Okay. Now, what about the pelvic floor exercises? Should blokes be involved 
in this? <laughs> they definitely should. So men have pelvic floor muscles, which you may not have been aware of, um, but it's important for men to do them just as it, it is for women as well. So it's important for everyone. I'm so happy to hear you say that because yeah. I've been on it my husband. <laughs> yes. He's got to come to Pilates with me. <laughs> Absolutely. So as far as the pelvic floor exercises, I'm always at the traffic lights like this, you know, yeah. with a weird look on my face. Is that the look on your face? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to concentrate. How often do, should we be doing our pelvic floor exercises? So it's a good habit to get into doing them two or three times a day, but mm. the tricky thing, Joe, is they're really hard to do. Like, you can't see these muscles. Mm. I mean, they're my favourite muscle in the whole body, um, but out of sight, out of mind. So they're tricky to do. I don't know if we want to have a go yes, right now. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. How, how do you would do you it? Would you like to hold the male pelvis, Gus? I would love to. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Which way around is it? Yeah. Like this. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's important to know where the bones are. So the pubic bone at the front. Oh, yep. <laughs> It up the right that was way. a yoga move you were doing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Pelvic yeah. rocking, Gus was. Yeah. Uh, so pubic bone at the front, then you've got your hip bones, your sit bones underneath, yeah. and then you've got your tailbone at the back. Mm -hmm. So the pelvic floor actually runs from the pubic bone at the front to the tailbone at the back. Okay. Okay. okay so you, can you picture it in your mind? Sure. Yeah. So he's when got you, it. He's got it? <laughs> Great. So it controls your bladder and bowel, holds everything in place, and yep. has a sexual function role as well. So when you contract it, it feels like you're sort of stopping from passing wind at the back and then stopping your urine flow Hold and it. you lift and squeeze. You doing it? Hold it. You got oh, I've, got a bit, I've got a bit of cramp on <laughs> <laughs> Relax, relax. You've got to let the muscle much, go as much. well. Don't let it go too And much. the other thing, Gus, is try and not... I oh, suck your breath up. So okay. you've got to try and relax everything, all your other muscles. Is everyone doing it? Joe's yeah, been doing I'm it the whole time yeah, I've been yeah, talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're doing it, Luke. So try and it's a squeeze and lift. So you hold that muscle inside. Feels like it's drawing up inside. And then let it go. All right? And try and keep breathing. <laughs> you don't have to deep breathe deeply. Just relax your breath. <laughs> so try and hold for five seconds. Do about eight or ten of those in a row. Yep. Three times a day is a good habit. And is it true that if you uh, try to stop yourself midstream if you're having a mm. wee, that is a good way of doing it as Yes, well? it's a good way to check that you've got the right technique, but oh, okay. you shouldn't do that too often because oh, okay. you can give yourself a bladder problem. Yeah. Oh, good yep. to know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the National Continence <laughs> Helpline have people who can help or head online to continence.org.au for more information. You can go to that website. Shana, thank you so much for coming in. Pleasure, Dars. Up next, a first-hand look at the impact of drought on our farmers and what our mate Gus is doing in a bid to help. Looking forward to that next on The House of Wellness. Welcome back. Australia remains in the grip of one of the most severe droughts on record. Above average temperatures combined with record low rainfall have devastated huge areas of farming land, particularly in the eastern states, Heinze. It's absolutely devastating, Das. We are seeing heartbreaking images of starving livestock and parched land, and our hearts go out to the farming families who are losing their livelihood and in many cases also losing hope. Devastating time for many in the bush, which is where you've kicked in to help Gus. And we love that about you, mate. You're always looking after other people. It's what you do. Tell us a bit about the drought support tour. Yes, yeah, certainly. We went out a couple of weeks ago and there's no way to sugarcoat it. It is absolutely desperate out there. And like you say, Heinze, we've got people losing their livestock, their livelihoods. There's no purpose for our farmers at the moment. So a man and a woman need to wake up each day and have some sort of purpose to move on. They are sitting there and they look up at the sky and they say, please rain. And it's just not raining. And that has happened for so long now. We've got farmers out there that haven't had proper yields for three or four years. If it rains from now to Christmas and they get everything they want, it still takes another year before they're back up and running again. The pressure on those people out there is immense. And there's never been more of a disconnect between the country and government and the country and the city. Well, it's interesting you say that because it's very easy for us city folk to sit back and see it on the news. And the vision's heartbreaking, but how bad is it really? It's like Mars out there. So we went across the Blue Mountains in New South Wales. Orange is not too bad, but as soon as you go west of Orange, it is like Mars. So there's not even dust and soil anymore. It is just purely that that red coloured, would you know, from sort of like Ayers Rock, yeah. that area, and just rocks. No sand, no soil, no anything. So you've got people out there that have got children, communities. No one's got any money on the farms, which means they're not putting money into the cities yeah. or into the towns, which means everyone has that flow-on effect. 
What does it mean to people? You, you get your mates around, Gus, and you're great, and you rally the troops. Does, does it make a, a tangible difference to the oh, people struggling? No doubt about it, Das. If you've got people that have got your back and they're telling you that, you that they love you and they care for you, it's about building the emotional intelligence in all Australian males so we're going to have a proper conversation around it. But let me tell you one particular man who's a principal. 143 students from HSC down to kindergarten. He has irrigated a little bit of land which would be about the size of a squash court and it is perfect buffalo grass. It is green and magnificent. And I just it just looks so amazing around all the other stuff. And I said, so what's the story behind this? And he said to me, I want the kids to come to school and have something that is living because everything else in their life is dead. Yeah. When you have a moment like that and you have school kids coming, taking their shoes and socks off and just putting their feet through the grass and then lying in it and just smelling it, having a bit of moisture around, that is such a beautiful thing. But that's, that tells you where they're at at the moment. Uh, great story, Gus, and well done again to you and uh, all the work that you do out there supporting our farmers. GQ, I know you've got a lot of friends on the land, as I have as well, who are out there doing it tough at the moment. It is enormously tough to us, and that connection that Gus talked about, we need to take some responsibility in the city as well and make some contact, share it around. Mm. But I'd like to talk about nourishing new life today, Gus. Yes, so last week we looked at how ginger and vitamin B6 can help with morning sickness. So what's on this week's pregnancy wellness menu? We're talking today, Joe, about bones and teeth in the developing baby. So mm -hmm. the story today is calcium. And calcium's really important. We need it for muscles, we need it for nerves, we need it for heart rhythm, and it even plays a role in the developing baby in blood clotting. So very important mineral. Right, so how does the growing bub get the calcium? Um, you know, the mum's eating it, the pregnant mm -hmm. mama, is it getting to the baby? Actually, the baby competes, Joe, with oh. the mum. So mums need extra calcium as well. So as soon as you eat or take some calcium, the baby is in there grabbing that and there needs to be enough to go around, essentially. And we need to look at how much. Mm. So the experts say, on average, we need about women need about 1,000 milligrams, but in pregnancy and breastfeeding, with advice, needs to go up to 1,200 to 1,400 milligram a day because of that competition. But it gets a little more complicated because we need vitamin D as well to ah. help with the absorption of the calcium. So there's no point taking the calcium if our body can't absorb it and use it. OK, so calcium and vitamin D during pregnancy, do mums need it after they give birth? They do because, remember, the way baby's competing for calcium and babies don't absorb vitamin D from their mum. They, do, they absorb D from the uterus while they're developing. So without the vitamin D, they are unable to use the calcium correctly as well. And remember, the calcium also is very important for mums because it helps keep blood pressure under control in pregnancy. It helps reduce the risk of preeclampsia, which is where mm. things can go wrong with blood pressure really and serious, fluid retention. Yeah. And it stops leg cramps, which is a very common quality of life issue during pregnancy. Oh, my goodness, I know that. So, obviously, very important. The A to Z of Vitamins is brought to you by NutriCare Pregma Plus, the only multi-stage soluble supplement to support your pregnancy journey. Looking for something to fill the gap for breakfast, a healthy snack, lunch, or even dessert? My chocolate raspberry chia puddings are easy to make, filling, and incredibly satisfying. The trick is to be organized. The chia seeds need to be soaked in coconut milk for four hours or overnight, and here's some I prepared earlier. For the raspberries, I like to add a little bit of ginger, maple syrup for sweetness, and blend it all up. You need to divide your chia mixture into two bowls and then pop the raspberry mixture on top of one. And the other half gets a chocolate fix with a scoop of the Biogland Chocolate Probiotic Breakfast Smoothie. It's packed full of plant protein, fibre, probiotics, which is great for gut health. It's a jar full of energy and it's 98% sugar free. Start with the chocolate layer. Put the raspberry layer on top. And garnish with whipped coconut cream. A few raspberries, 
some cacao nibs and some chopped pistachios. Enjoy this morning, noon or night. Now that looks brilliant. <laughs> I want one right now. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. What about Heinz? You keep talking about all this food and you're apparently in the kitchen. Or any well, danger that you could bring something to the table? If you <laughs> keep behaving yourself and you play your cards right, I might just whip something up before the end of the year. Watch this space. <gasps> well, while you guys are banging on about food, Gus and I have had a different conversation about something far more athletic, the pentathlon, of all things. Mm. So here's a quiz. Who can name all five sports? In the modern pent pentathlon. I'll oh, back you, Gus. This is your yeah, yeah, I reckon. Gus, go for it. I think I'm good here. Yeah. I think it is swimming, cross country, there's a bit of fencing in there, show jumping. Show jumping. And there's a shooting. Bit of shooting, yeah. Strange Shoot as well. Yeah. Let's do, well, you know why? <laughs> it's gone back to like the 19th century. It's sort of when a soldier was sort of behind enemy lines. That's the type of skills that he needed to survive. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, that's an interesting history lesson. Thanks, Gus. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> One very modern Aussie legend in the event is Chloe Esposito, who won Olympic gold in 2016 and who found herself the target of our 60 second slam. Would have to be opening and closing ceremony. Ooh, Taria Pitt. I, yeah, definitely Taria Pitt. Uh, I love a bit of smashed avo on toast. Mm, oh, I think I'd like to go see the Northern Lights. I want to be a school teacher, actually. Uh, I always wanted to be an athlete, but if it wasn't sport wise, yeah, a school teacher. I pretty much like anything. Oh, I don't like to do like box jumps and stuff like that. I'd prefer to just go for a run. <laughs> oh, birds. Birds. I don't like birds. If anything, if one comes near, it just freaks me out. <laughs> My family might say ditzy, but I'd say bubbly. <laughs> Let's go. Ah, uh, Chloe's a star. <laughs> Lucky enough to be in Brazil for the Olympics and when she won the gold medal, that was one of the highlights of the Games, Jo. Wow, how awesome! She was the first Aussie to ever win gold in the event and was coached by her dad, Daniel, who competed in the modern pe pentathlon, I can't say it, <laughs> at the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics. Her brother competes in the modern pentathlon as well. I know you've oh. interviewed Chloe before, Gus. Oh. She's just a star. And she in Tokyo is not too far away. Let's exactly. hope she can go back to back. 100%. When you see her, that's exactly who she is. Overexcited, really pumped. And she's one of those Aussies you can really get behind. Really contagious energy too. Yeah, yeah. She's an absolute star. That's it for this week. Thanks so much to our man Gus for joining us. It's been great to Thanks catch up with me, you. Guys. Head to houseofwellness.com.au for more information on anything we've covered on today's show. Plus, remember, as always, to tune in to our radio show every Sunday. And thanks to our good friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you next time. Yes. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Great, mate. You should come back next week. Okay.